Hello, everyone. We had an echo in the room. We had to start again. How lovely that you could be here. I've been very much looking forward to this um, experience together. A little bit too excited, I think. Um, uh, we're going to be together now for quite a number of sessions, at least 14 and conceivably a few more. just depends on how we travel. So um, I think first we'll pray and then everything else that I want to tell you, I'll tell you afterwards. But this journey is a bit unusual. You know, it's not like we're really in a bus together having traveled thousands of miles and actually being physically in the places that we're about to visit. We're going to have to visit them in heart and spirit. But I think we can. At least I believe we can have a pilgrimage of a kind in which the power and the presence of the Spirit really comes to us. So much depends on the openness of our hearts and the sincerity of our call. So let's begin now with the deep invocation of all the Masters, and of course especially of Jesus, since it's His life that we'll be living through. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Walk with us in our inner spirit that as we visit in spirit these holy places and immerse ourselves in the glorious story of the incarnation of Jesus, help us to understand that this is not history. This is eternity. This is living reality. This is our lives now. This is your promise of our infinite bliss. We are your children. Guide us and bless us. Om. Peace. Amen. I think I'd actually like to start right in with one of Swami's beautiful pieces, which is really the theme for everything we're about to do. It's God's call within listen listen whispering within your soul hints of laughter hints of joy sweet songs of sadness of quenchless yearning for the light for my love your true home long your heart has played the dance long you've toyed with merest shadows of the treasures left behind you deep in your soul long you plumbed the dark for answers long you've begged from beggars empty hands gifts of life they too were seeking gifts none could share friend how long will you Friend, as long as you seek your home In a land where all are strangers Love locks her door Leave to the weak his craven life To the coward leave his dreaming O oh, my saint, wake up, reclaim the light Seek the truth behind all seeming 
Leave to the weak his craving life, to the coward leave his dreaming. O oh, my saint, wake up, reclaim the light, seek the truth behind all seeming. Turn, turn, turn within, in silence of soul, in cave of love, find my abode. Listen, listen, whispering within. Hints of laughter, hints of joy, sweet songs of sadness, of quenchless yearning for the light, for my love, your Let's just have a moment of silence to just take the message and the spirit of that song into our hearts and let it be the theme to which we return, not only during this time that we're together, but also in all these months. As we go through Christmas, as we go through Easter, listen within my soul. Hints of laughter, hints of joy. Peace. Amen. So now, my friends, let me just give you an idea of what we're going to do. When we travel physically, um, we're bound by geography, we're bound by where the plane lands and the number of days that we have and so on like this. When I started thinking about this journey, I realized when we're not bound by geography, I can actually just go through the life of Christ chronologically because we can just move all over the country. Um, I'm, the, the, the whole idea that we're going to pretend to be physically traveling, we're not going to carry that to, to too great an extreme. But for many of the places that we'll go, um, I will put, we will put on the screen some photographs, either that were taken on trips that we traveled on, mostly by Karen Gamow, all by Karen Gamow, or that, are just, uh, that I just found, pictures that exist. Um, I'm not... A, 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 a political tour guide. I'm not a geographic tour guide. I'm not a historian. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm not an academic. I'm not. I'm not really interested in every minute detail of everything. And I. And if you read through, everybody has lots of different opinions about who said what to whom and who actually lived and what it really meant. So from all of that, I mean that that's not my. That's not my source. And of course, that's not my inspiration either. Everything that I'm going to offer about the life of Christ, much of which is, 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 is not necessarily wide, widely um, agreed upon, is simply what I learned from Swamiji and what I learned from Master. What I learned from Master's writings and what I heard Swamiji reiterate. And so some of the things, especially as we go through about certain characters in the Bible and so on, there's a degree of interpretation. I've also read a number of sources of people who claim to either have past life regression or um, clairvoyant memory, but anything that I'm just pulling out of what is probably true, there was some endorsement from Swamiji on some level, so it wasn't just my assertion, or 
it's apocryphal, is how I would put it. Because here's what it is that I feel is important for us as we go through this. Jesus is the first in the line of gurus that Master brought to the West. And his putting Jesus on the altar was not just a, a, a gesture of respect to the culture in which he was in. It was the fact that, as he writes in Autobiography of a Yogi, that Babaji and Jesus together um, are the avatars of this age, and together they have planned the salvation of our planet. And they're very concerned about the very conditions that we're seeing manifest around us, racial hatred, religious bigotry, excessive materialism. The list is long. We don't have to reiterate it. And they've planned the salvation of this age, which is to awaken um, true experience of the unifying power of the divine within us all. And the practice of Kriya Yoga, um, which is simply to say the practice of deep inner communion. And toward the end of his life, and and in Master's um, mission to the West, He had a particular commission from Babaji, which was to restore the original teachings of Krishna and the original teachings of Jesus and to show that they are the same, that Sanatana Dharma, the underlying truth of our spiritual nature, the both masters had the same revelation. Now, at the end of Swamiji's life, he went a step further, and he felt after writing revelations of Christ and other works that he did, he became convinced, and that's how he put it, I've become convinced that in fact Master himself incarnated in the person of Jesus. Um, When Swamiji asked asked Master directly, were you Jesus Christ? Master said, what difference would it make? Which was a way of saying, not saying yes, but not saying no either. When I asked Swamiji about it, Swami just laughed and he said, can you imagine? Master had enough problems in the U.S. being accepted and getting his teachings across. If he had claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, there wouldn't have been a chance in the world for him to have been taken seriously by almost anyone. So he just let the issue lie. Um, I, of course, have no way of, of verifying that, but I know from years of experience with Swamiji, He would never have made such an assertion without having solid intuitive ground for making it. Swamiji didn't always explain himself, but on the occasions when he did, we knew that he was far from frivolous in any conclusion he made. Now, it's not at all necessary for you to accept that fact is true. Here is how it influences the way I'm going to present what I'm going to be sharing with you as these weeks go on. I had, as many of you know, the extraordinary blessing, a blessing that every day continues to amaze me more and more, of of being in close association with Swami Kriyananda um, from, well, from 1969 when I met him in 71 when I moved to Ananda Village until his passing in 2013. And um, because of that, And because of the intuitive conviction that I developed that Swamiji was and is a true representative of Master and that the way he lived in the world, the way he interacted with the world and the way he interacted with all of us and me personally represented exactly how Master behaved. The difference, Swamiji always uh, never asserted that his consciousness was equal to Master But by the end of his life, he was willing to acknowledge that the difference between them was hard to see. And the only relevant point to that is, I feel from my many years of experience with Swamiji, and not only with him personally, I've met a few other teachers, but that's not really the point. But I've also been in community all this time, and I've seen many hundreds of people walk through the spiritual path, some to grow ever deeper and more committed, some to become um, enamored of um, other teachings, other ways, some to become negative. There's just 
all the th- different things that happen to people. As Swamiji often commented, community is, is a laboratory of spiritual experience, and it not only provides a marvelous supportive environment for those of us who are in it, but it's a constant experiment that we can observe because we observe attitudes and behaviors in people and then over a course of time, because we've been together for so many decades, um, you, you see the fruit of certain actions. Now how that becomes relevant is when, when I read the stories of holy people you know, even whether they're, or I'm going to start with a couple of Old Testament figures, um, but when I read the story of Jesus and I read about his disciples and the things that happen, they're, they're distant in time, but there's, a, a, an ex, to my mind, an accessible human reality to it. So that in, even though the Bible at times is quite terse, about who said what, and they don't give you a whole context, I, I feel, and I hope that you will find it also inspiring to you, that I can understand how it felt to be there. Because I was so often in very profoundly spiritually uplifting um, experiences with Swamiji, in which I essentially saw the same energies playing them out. So, If we add to that the idea that the very vibration of Jesus was our vibration, our vibration meaning the vibration of this ray of teaching. Now whether we go so far as to um, agree with Swamiji that Master was indeed um, Jesus in a previous lifetime, and Master said that the three wise men were Babaji, Lahiri, and Sri Yukteswar, and um, if we at least apply that template, then it becomes even easier to bring what would otherwise be distant, rather on the mountaintop figures, into something that we can feel more um, immediately from our own experience. So, with that sort of introduction, and our our plan is a is a relatively simple one. We're using a little bit of technology, but I. I, I didn't want to make this into some kind of an audio-visual extravaganza, so we're using the simplest kind of technology, which is we have... Now, of course, I should add here, in 1983-84, around that time, um, Swami Kriyananda took a pilgrimage to India uh, to Israel. He had visited very briefly once before, but this was the first time he really went on a pilgrimage there, and he went with um, Rosanna, who was an Italian woman um, who was his wife for a number of years. And she was a deeply devoted Catholic. Um, She had come up through Catholicism and was very deeply devoted to Christ. And Swami said part of the wonderful experience he had in the Holy Land was that her devotion um, was palpable and and he was able to also go deeper because of her depth in everything he did. And when he came back, he wrote the oratorio, Christ lives in the Holy Land and in you. And so for many of the places that we'll we'll walk through in in this, there are specific songs that Swami wrote um, related to that place through his oratorio, or a song from the oratorio that applies, or simply some piece of music of his that seems exactly apt. We're going to favor the recordings that Swami himself made. So much of the time you'll actually be listening to his own voice, which means there's not audio. So we'll either be putting pictures of the place or just a picture of Christ for us to enjoy. And all of it will happen in a very informal, easy way, which I hope will add to your experience. Tonight being our first night, we'll see how smoothly things run, but I think we'll manage. All right. Now, um, let me just think if there's anything else. No, for now, that's all I would say. When, when Swamiji went to Israel for the first time, um, the, the room in Jerusalem, the room where the Last Supper took place, is literally physically right above um, the space which is called the Tomb of David. 
And the tomb of David is a very holy site, um, especially to the Jewish people. And it's actually held as a Jewish synagogue. And men have to put on a yarmulke to go in there. And um, the men and the women are kept separate when you go in there. And Swamiji's, um, he went because it was right there. It was just a, literally a few steps away from the room that was, the, that, that, the particular room, we'll get to it later, but that room is, is a replica of where Jesus was. It's not necessarily authentic. The tomb of David is, uh, they say, is empty, that there's not actually anything in the tomb. But it is the place dedicated to King David, and I'll say a little bit more about David in a moment, because he's our, he's our starting point. And Swami went in there, he said, rather casually, and was quite astonished by the power of the vibration that he felt there. And then he put to music one of the psalms that King David wrote, which is simply called the Psalm of David. And in a few minutes, we'll both see the tomb and we'll also listen to Swamiji singing that song, or to, to that song being sung. But first I want to sort of bring us all the way back now in the life of Jesus. For those of you who are familiar at all with the New Testament, um, they talk about how um, Jesus himself was of the lineage of the house of David. David was uh, sort of the one of the, it's hard to say what the beginning point of Judaism. Judaism, of course, began with Moses. And the whole Old Testament, which I have read once, but by no means do I know that book, and nor can I comprehend a great deal of it. It's just, it's very ancient, and it doesn't speak to me all that much, although there are great portions of it. But one of the stories in the Old Testament is about King David. And King David, um, throughout the Old Testament, we have all of these kings fighting each other. Now, I need to put another piece in here. Um, a a very significant part of the whole story and history of the life of Jesus and and the history I'm about to tell you now, which is King David and the prophet Elijah and his disciple Elisha, who are all significant precursors in the Jewish tradition for the coming of the Messiah. So a certain amount of controversy and uh, things that happened in the life of Jesus are, are related to these three great figures that came hundreds of years before them. So I'm not going to go through everything before the life of Jesus, but just these so we'll understand it. But all of this is Kali Yuga descending. Um, David was said to have lived, let me just see, I think he lived about 900 years, yes, um, 900 years um, before the coming of Christ from 960 B.C. to 922 B.C. I have a few details in front of me. It's almost a thousand years before Jesus came. Now, Jesus came, and this is what I want to say, this was all descending Kali Yuga. And if you really want to think about a dark, unenlightened age, descending Kali Yuga, except for the nadir of Kali Yuga, which is what we're, we're racing toward here, this, this whole period of time uh, was when man's consciousness was becoming darker and darker and denser and denser and thicker and thicker. And all the inspiration of Dwapar Yuga before, of Treta Yuga before that, of Satya Yuga before that, the Yuga cycle is 24,000 years, 12,000 years from the apex to the nadir, 12,000 years from the nadir back up to the apex, then the apex begins to decline again. And there's four ages. Kali Yuga is the age of matter. It's the lowest age. Dwapar is the age of energy. It's the second age. Um, Treta is the power of thought. And Satya is the power of consciousness. And the history of the world makes much more sense when we talk about the Yugas. And all history makes more sense when we talk about the Yugas. So what's happening um, in the entire story of Christ, and this will become relevant as we go through this, is that, that there, were, there was a much more enlightened age that, that um, had power in it. But slowly by slowly, the mass of humanity is losing touch with that power. Now, 
we are in the beginning of Dwapara Yuga on an ascending cycle. So what's happening in our time is that greater and greater understanding is coming to us. Kali Yuga being material age, everything is separate. Dwapara Yuga being an age of energy, all these divisions begin to dissolve. So now I'm sitting here asserting that the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Krishna are the same teachings. I'm even suggesting that Jesus himself Yogananda was a reincarnation of that, that these masters lived before. These ideas were not easily understood during Kali Yuga. So a great deal of what happened in the, in the history of the Old Testament into the beginning of the New Testament is just everything is getting more and more fractured, more contentious. Um, uh, there's more disharmony. Uh, there's more division, more fighting. And um, the nadir of Kali Yuga was 500 years after Jesus died. So all of this is all Kali Yuga descending. So some of the chaos described in the Old Testament is because everything is fracturing. And it was that's what happened during that period of time and in the early part of Kali Yuga rising too. But as we've advanced, it's not quite so bad anymore. I mean, a very good example of Kali Yuga is when Jesus was crucified, that was not a unique punishment set up for Jesus. Crucifixion was how they executed anybody and everybody that they felt had done something that they didn't want them to do. And the executions were public. Sometimes they even said along the roads there would be, there would be people being crucified just sort of lining the roads. I mean, we can't, we can't even conceive of such barbarism, but it, that's, what, that's what it was just right at that time. So a lot of what happened makes sense if we think like that. Now, the one thing I have to add, and you know, many of you know this, but I want to have these ideas clearly in our mind. The yugas are a, an, an ast- astronomical phenomenon on a physical planet having to do with where that planet is in relation to the grand central energy of the galaxy. And so Earth goes on, as the Masters explain it, as Sri Yukteswar explains it, it's an elliptical orbit created by the fact that, the, that there's a dual, that our Sun has a dual, but that's a detail that doesn't matter. Earth goes on an elliptical orbit that takes us closer and farther away from the central energy of our galaxy. As we move closer to it, enlightenment and energy increases on planet Earth, and it becomes a more refined and more civilized um, atmosphere. And then as we, as we reach the nadir, the, the apex, the closest point, and we begin to move away from it, then consciousness on planet Earth begins to decline. Now, Master said there are countless inhabited planets, and every inhabited planet is going through its own yuga cycle, because that is the, a phenomenon of the material world. But the real drama, as far as we ourselves are concerned, is that every individual soul is on its own personal journey from delusion to God-realization. And that journey, according to Sanatana Dharma and according to actually Judaism at the time of Jesus and and to Christianity for many centuries afterwards, is that that the jiva, which is the individual soul, Um, moves in and out of many physical bodies. In other words, it's born, it lives in incarnation, physical body dies, the energy body which holds the karmic pattern withdraws. At the appropriate time, the energy body moves into another physical form, lives through another physical incarnation, and it's progressive. It's progressive also in time. Swamiji was asked that question. Do we jump around in time? in our incarnations. And Swami said, no, the material universe is bound by time. So when we move into it, we're also bound by time. That's just an interesting side fact there. But when we're in the astral world, deciding what planet to go to, Swamiji asked Master, do we always incarnate on Earth? And Master said, oh no, quote, you would find out too fast. (laughs) Of course, you want to ask him what's wrong with that. But he said, there are countless planets to go to. So from the astral world, we we are drawn to, we choose, I don't know exactly how you would word that. We look for an atmosphere, for a a context, a material context, planet, country, culture, family, 
religion, whatever is required, yuga, that will serve the true purpose of creation, which is the journey from delusion to enlightenment. So if it serves us to live in Satya Yuga at the, at the apex, that's where we'll incarnate. If it serves us to, incar- to live in Kali Yuga at the nadir, then that's where, in- where we'll incarnate. The benefit of Kali Yuga at the nadir, in fact of Kali Yuga descending, is that one can withdraw from society and simply live in isolation with God because there's no point in building anything. Because, but as we are in Dwapar Yuga rising, we have to live in society because we're bringing the spiritual teaching back out again. So, with all that in mind, we have the story of King David. And King David was a, a devoted Jew, and they were all, um, there were constant battles. You know, the, there is huge historical information here, but I, I'm not familiar with it, and it's not relevant. It would just distract us too long. Suffice to say that David was a great lover of God. He was a great king. He was a great conqueror. He was a great devotee. The Psalms of David are some of the most exquisite, and as I said, we'll hear one in a moment, some of the most exquisite divine poetry that there is. And it was David who actually brought, um, uh, conquered, and then moved in to Jerusalem. And then it was through David's... um, devotion, that Jerusalem gradually began to develop the power that it developed. Now, David wanted, once he moved into that city, he wanted to create a beautiful temple um, in, in honor of God, because there had been there was always wars and destructions, and so he wanted to build a beautiful temple. Now bear in mind, and this is important, this is important all through the life of Jesus, this is Kali Yuga. And so when we want to express something in Kali Yuga, we don't think in terms of the energy and the spirit. We think of the material thing. We, we, we want to, to make things show in the material world. And power is understood in material terms. You have wealth, you have armies, you have buildings that are huge and um, uh, ornate and so on like that. But David, despite the fact that he was deeply devoted to God, also was seriously tempted. And there's the very famous story of David and Bathsheba. Now, David is the king, and monarchs had absolute rights at that time. And men took many wives, and kings took as many wives as they wanted. And David had a number of wives and offspring already. But David, as devoted as he was to God, nonetheless, he saw this woman. Her name was Bathsheba. And she was, he saw her from his palace. She was on the roof, a nearby roof is how it was described. And she was bathing in such a way that he was able to see her enormous physical beauty. And he developed a tremendous desire to have her as his wife. So he She was, however, married to another man who was a soldier in David's army, and David still had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba because her husband was away. As the Bible tells the story, Bathsheba conceived a child with David. Um, And when her husband returned, um, David was hoping that he would go to his wife, and then perhaps it would not be known that the child was his child, because David knew that he had committed a great sin in doing this. However, um, her husband, who was a captain in the army, never visited his wife, but then was sent off immediately to battle. So David now decided that he would make Bathsheba his wife, and so he sent her husband to the front lines of a war in which he knew for sure that he would be slain. And he was slain. And then David was able to marry Bathsheba. However, this was a sin. And as great and as holy as David was, um, this was a, a blight on his, um, on the purity of his nature. And as a result, God told him that he would not be able to build a temple. He would not be allowed to build a temple because he wasn't 
um, because the, this, uh, the bad karma of this. I mean, then, when you when you read the test, the New Testament, especially Kings one and Kings two, which is where we talk about Elijah and Elisha, it's all about karma. It's all about if you do the right thing, God is pleased with you, and if you do the wrong thing, God smites you. And a lot of people do the wrong thing, so God smites you. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth. And everybody's trying to avoid being smited and being blessed. But even the best of them, like David, um, things happen. So David was told that um, he wouldn't be able to build the temple, that that his son Solomon would build the temple. So um, let me just get this straight. I always get a little confused here. So Solomon did build the temple. He was his son right afterwards, and it was, it was, he built a temple that lasted for, for 400 years, and I'll speak to that in just a moment. Let me just finish with David. But David is considered to be the starting point of the divine lineage. And in several places in the Old Testament, even though David had this bad karma to, to pay off, he, he recovered completely from the error that he's made, and in, in a number of places in the Old Testament, the statement is made that, that David's lineage would live on and that the, the prediction is made. And this becomes a, a, an integral part of, of the Jewish understanding of the coming of the Messiah, is that the Messiah will be from the house of David. So many of us who, who sing some of these songs, you know, we sing out Hosanna to the son of David. And him being the son of David is important because this is how the lineage runs. Now, I've always had this sort of thought in my mind of that, you know, the, that spiritual realization is, is an individual reality and it can't be inherited merely um, through... Uh, through birth. And this actually becomes an issue later when we're starting to talk about the different warring factions in Judaism at the time of Jesus' life, because one of the factions believed in a hereditary priesthood. And that was one of the arguments. I mean, this is what happened in India with the Brahmins, that originally Brahmins were Brahmins because of their spiritual stature. But then when a man with spiritual, had spiritual stature, he naturally wanted to pass that stature on to his son. And so gradually, caste, priestly caste became inherited rather than earned by spiritual merit. So I've always had that thought in my mind that Jesus being of the lineage of David, I could never really quite understand it, but it's such an important idea, and I just never knew what to do with it. In fact, two of the Gospels begin with this long uh, heritage of, of who came, you know, of so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and this was the son, and this was the son, and you go through 30-some generations until you get to Joseph, and then you get to Jesus. And the two Gospels don't quite match, but nonetheless, it's there. But I was having this conversation this morning with Sai Ganesh, who many of you know. And Sai Ganesh is uh, from India, raised in a, and, and has a, a very broad understanding of the tradition there. And he pointed out to me that in the Indian epics too, the lineage is often very important. And it goes, often you, they, they trace it back. Rama was the son of so-and-so, who was the son of so-and-so. And it goes way back. And even the name of the incarnation is often the son of some very heroic ancestor. And Sai Ganesh gave me an absolutely beautiful way to think about it. He said the way they think about it then is that the great, the spiritual greatness and the great good karma and the great gift that David, because of his enormous spiritual realization, um, gave to the world, manifested eventually in this Messiah. And tracing it through that physical lineage is one way of saying it, but what they're really saying is that, is that just as um, a curse can be passed down, because um, David's the son of Beth of Bathsheba did not live, because the sin of the father was passed down, and also for other things that David did, and actually it was the same. His his own son rebelled against him later, because his bad karma was passed down, but also the good karma 
was passed down. So it suddenly just took the whole idea of uh, Jesus being the son of David, and it makes it, even if we can trace it uh, genealogically, what it really what it really says is the living power of God that manifested through David also then manifested through Jesus. And the other part of this, which um, it, 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 when we were in Israel, when, when I have gone to Israel now over these um, four trips that I've taken in recent years, it, it is true that I, I still have a relationship with Judaism. And I'm not really sure what that relationship is or with being Jewish. But it, 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 it became more vivid when I was in Israel. Both the ancient and the modern. The modern is irrelevant, but the ancient was real. Because the entire life of Jesus took place in the context of the synagogue and the temple. And the entire controversy, everything about it, was because um, he was engaged in this magnificent spiritual tradition. Now, this magnificent spiritual tradition, in certain ways, had fallen onto hard times because it was Kali Yuga descending. That didn't, however, touch the greatness of the tradition. And this is when Master was asked about Moses. Oh, yes, Master said, of course, Master was an avatar. And there's the story told in the Bible about how Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness. And for those who understand yogic imagery, because these books being written in descending ages had to be written symbolically. But serpent is the sign of the kundalini always, and the wilderness is in the solitude of your own consciousness. When a, a, any a saintly figure goes into the wilderness, it means that he goes into the the um, infinite realms of his own awareness. He may also leave the city and go to the desert, but the true wilderness is inside. Moses raising the serpent in the wilderness, Master said, was a statement of his complete realization. So, so Judaism was um, began with an avatar, and what he what it taught was pure sanat and dharma. Over the course of centuries, when virtue declines. And Adharma gets in the ascendant, I, the infinite spirit, take visible form. And that was Jesus taking visible form to the Jewish people. And the whole fight um, that led to his crucifixion was people of the same spiritual persuasion who were the, la- the, 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 the only expression of Sanat and Dharma in the entire civilization that they were part of. Everyone else was pagan in the sense that they, they were propitiating gods and all kinds of things I'll speak a little about. Um, they didn't understand, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which is um, a statement not of sectarianism, but of absolute universality. There is only one reality in the world. And then the sentence that comes after that, that expresses in countless diverse ways. But here, O Israel, listen, there is only one reality behind it all. It's a profound Vedantic truth that's being spoken there. Um, now, let me, and, and when we were in Israel, I have to say this, and you will have the, the opportunity to hear this man soon. We met a, a Kabbalah mystic, who an American man who's been in Israel for decades, and his expression of Judaism was exactly like ours. Go to the Palo Alto calendar. His name is Avraham. And in, sometime in November, he's going to give a program for us. And he'll, he'll give you true Judaism. So now we have David, and then we have Solomon, his son. And then Solomon builds what is known as, guess what? The Temple of Solomon, which is the first Temple of Solomon, which in the, the, the hearts and spirits of the Jewish people, they, they, they hold forth this exquisite Temple of Solomon. And it was, he came after his father, of course. He built it around 800. And it stood um, until the 500, fi- about 500 years, or five and a half hundred years before the birth of Christ. Um, and it was destroyed in everything that happens at that period of time. And 70 years later, it was rebuilt. And the temple that Jesus was part of in Jerusalem was the second temple, 
that was built um, around 516 B.C. is when it was built, okay, which was 70 years after it was destroyed. Now, having, having said all that, I'm skipping a little bit ahead. I'm going to go now back to 800 years before the coming of Christ um, to Elijah and Elias. So the way the Old Testament runs, and it's actually... Now this is, I'm coming back to the fact that I've lived, because I've lived with Swamiji, and I sort of know how these things work a little bit more from first-hand experience. I mean, does that make sense? It's like when you live with a highly advanced spiritual person, you begin to understand how spirit moves in the world. And hearing him constantly referring and telling us about how Master moved in the world, then you begin to see all these old stories, that's what I was saying earlier, you can ground them in an actual experience. So all through the, um, the ancient history, which is all described in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is kings vying for power, generally messing up in one way or another. And when Solomon's reign ended, there's, um, things began to decline after Solomon because Solomon made some mistakes. He was allowed to build the temple, but he married uh, pagan, I'm using that word and that might not be the right word, he married women, some women, some of his wives worshipped other gods and he allowed them to bring that worship into um, his kingdom. And apparently Yahweh was not pleased with that. Also very interestingly they say that Solomon began to accumulate too much wealth and began to build up too great an army. And then he began also to, to force his people um, to serve him. And these were not good things to have done. In other words, he, the, but what was really happening, you see, is that Kali Yuga is descending. And so the purity and the greatness is just more and more difficult to sustain. So things were a little bit chaotic for a long time. And this is how the temple got destroyed and so on. But So we have all these stories of all these kings fighting each other and some of them being obedient to God and some of them not. This is, this is the book of kings. There are two books of kings and this is them. And it's karma, just acting itself out. If you're righteous, you thrive. If you're unrighteous, you're smitten. And there you go. We just try to thrive. We try to be blessed instead of smitten. And then as a theme through all of these times, we have all these different prophets. And, and it, at that time, the the Israelites, the Jewish people, or the Judeans, the whatever they were called at that time, they all looked to the prophets. They understood who the prophets were, which is it's just very interesting because in the Indian tradition, they understood who the avatars were. You know, there's this there's this long tradition through India of these in, these exceptional, enormously advanced, uh, great souls that incarnate. And then they guide all of society. So through the ancient society, there were these prophets, one after another. And some of them were much greater than others. And they, the prophets had their, they call them schools for prophets, oddly enough. But what they really meant was an ashram full of disciples where the spiritual teachings were um, transmitted. It sounds so funny that you go to school to become a prophet. <laughs> And that's the word that's used all through the Old Testament. And it seems so funny. But when I thought about it, of course, I mean, you would be called to be with your master because the drama of the jiva is the same in all ages. And the, and the disciple-guru relationship is fundamental to the jiva's progression from delusion to, to, um, to enlightenment. So at the time that Elijah incarnated, which was about in the 9th century, which is 800 BC, um, there was a king and that uh, the, the god Baal, B-A-A-L, was making lots of inroads and, he was, and there was this constant war going on between the people who were leaving the true faith and becoming engaged in these and Baal was a, a nature god, and there were Bacchanalian rites. You know, it was it was a, a, a somewhat debauched form of worship. And Elijah uh, first appears in the Old Testament when he uh, goes to a king whose name is Ahab, whose wife was named Jezebel. And the word Jezebel still has a certain connotation, which is not very 
positive in most circles because Jezebel was a very evil woman. And she was a, 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 a devotee of the god of Baal. And she was strongly influencing her husband Ahab to disregard Sanatan Dharma, which had been Judaism, but now we're in Kali Yuga descending, you see. So whereas the kings used to be very faithful and very um, true to Sanatan Dharma, now Kali Yuga was coming and everything was getting confused. But Elijah, sent by God, and now Elijah is a rather wild figure. He's, a, he's an anchorite. He, he dressed in animal skins. He does not conform to normal standards, but apparently that's how they liked their, te- their prophets in those days. <laughs> so in the, in the Old Testament, Elijah comes to Ahab and to Jezebel, and he says, because of your terrible um, behavior, all the awful things you're doing and the way you're disregarding God. Now, Baal was the god of rain and of dew and of thunder and of lightning. And Elijah says, there will be no rain. He even says, there will be no dew. There will be no moisture on this land for three years. And he just pronounces this curse. And then he um, runs away (laughs) because Ahab and Jezebel are quite angry with him. So he, he hides out in the wilderness for three years, and just as he predicted, the whole kingdom is struck with terrible drought, and the suffering is, is enormous. Jezebel is convinced if she can find Elijah and kill him, that that will solve the problem. This is the Old Testament version of shoot the messenger. <laughs> that he's, Elijah's the one who delivered the bad news, so if we just get rid of the one who, who delivered the bad news, then the bad news won't exist anymore. But um, Elijah is able to hide out. And then through the Old Testament, there's a few stories told about Elijah's greatness. That's very, it's very interesting how this goes. I have different versions of the Bible, and perhaps next week I'll show you some of them. And one of them, which I really enjoy, is a, a, a complete chronological Bible where, especially the New Testament, all the Gospels are combined. So you can just read through, and you don't have to read four of them in order to find out. You can just read them all sequentially like this. But it's, it's a very uh, fundamental Christian, fundamentalist Christian edition in a very sweet way. But it's a G- Jesus Christ is the only Savior, the only Son of God's Spirit. So they remark how interesting it is that Elijah and Elisha, also his disciple, they did a lot of the same miracles that Jesus did. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> but they did, of course, because there's only like a certain, you raise the dead, you heal the sick, you make the blind to see. So there's a few stories told about Elijah just to give us a feeling of what his power was. And during those three years, he took shelter with a very poor widow. And even though people were starving everywhere, Elijah promised her, he was sent to her by God, and, and when she he promised her, that she would always have flour and oil. In other words, that she would never starve. And she was a widow with a son. And so by Elijah's spiritual power, um, she, she and her son were able to eat and they were able to feed him and much time passed. But then the son um, became sick and then he died. And so Elijah you know, says to the Lord, this woman was willing to shelter me all these years, and it is not right that you take her son from her. And so Elijah went, and he, he, he laid himself over the dead body of, the, chi- of the, the son, who I think was a child, over the child. And the son, who had not been breathing, came back to life. So these are just stories to, to give you about Elijah's power. And then... God told Elijah to go to the king and tell the king that after three years that the drought was going to end, but the message was not because you have repented, but because in my mercy, the Lord says, I'm going to spare your country anyway. Then Elijah's not content just to end the drought like that, but he, because the worship of Baal is still happening, And Elijah is there. He's there to witness the truth, and he's not shy about doing it. Now, just to to make this more clear, I should say this. Um, Master said in in, uh, 
In the New Testament, Jesus says, and I, I should have said this much earlier, Jesus says that, um, okay, let me, let me just let me get this more clear. The Old Testament ends with, uh, w- with the book of Malachi, and the last lines are that before the Messiah comes, I, the Lord says, I will send Elijah. So it was an entire part of the Jewish tradition when Jesus incarnated that before the Messiah could come, Elijah had to incarnate. And it was fundamental to the Jewish tradition. All of these rituals and relationships, they were all about calling Elijah. Because if we can call Elijah, Elijah will come and he'll make straight the way of the way for the Lord. He'll, he'll put everything in order so that then the Messiah can come. So part of the discussion, much a discussion, about whether Jesus is the Messiah is whether or not Elijah has already come. And in several places in the Bible, when that question is raised, Jesus says, Elijah has come, but you did not recognize him. And the people knew he was speaking of John the Baptist. And the character of John the Baptist, when we get closer to it, he had many of the same characteristics that Elijah had. And the end of the Old Testament, when Elijah and his disciple Elisha, at, when, at the passing of Elijah, I'll, I'll speak about that in just a moment, um, Master said that Elijah and Elisha were the previous incarnations of John the Baptist and Jesus. And it seems probable that it was Sri Yukteswar and Master. So whenever we start talking about Elijah, the personality that's presented and the personality that's presented by John the Baptist also bear a very close resemblance to the personality that was described to us of Sri Yukteswar in his forthrightness, in his disregard for convention, in his complete independence, and and just his absolute frankness in what he said. So we have the power of Elijah here, and now he's come back after these three years of doubt of drought because God has sent him to talk to this king again. It's not that Elijah's seeking this out, but God has sent him. And so once again, Elijah rails against the king for his allowing this debauched worship of the god Baal to happen. And Elijah says, I challenge your god Baal. And he says, so they set up this challenge and they go to the top of Mount Carmel. And before we finish this hour, we're also going to the top of Mount Carmel, which is up in the uh, northern part of Israel um, by the coast. And at the top of Mount Carmel, um, Elijah sets up this this, um, challenge that that they bring two bulls, two two cows, uh, cattle, yes, did I say it, bulls, yes, two bulls there, 450 priests of Baal come. Why 450? I have no idea. But there's 450 priests of Baal, and there's Elijah. And here is the challenge. You will slaughter the animal as an offering to your God. We will build, you will build an altar to your God with fire and wood, with wood, everything. You will place the meat upon the, the wood, and you will call down fire from heaven. And, and that's what you have to do. That's what the priests of Baal will do. That's what Elijah will do. And the priests go first. And so they, they slaughter the, the cow. They put the meat on the wood. They set up the whole altar according to their, their ways. And for hours and hours, the priests do the incantations and the rituals and the dances and everything that they, they uh, can do. Absolutely nothing happens. So then it's Elijah's turn. So he, ha- he slaughters the bull, he, puts, he makes a, a pile of wood, he puts the, the meat on the, there, he digs a big trench around where the altar is. This is how it's all described in the Bible. Then he has people bring jugs and jugs and jugs of water. So he completely drenches all the wood, he drenches the offering, and the channel around the altar fills up with water. And then... You know, when everything is stacked against him, Elijah invokes the power of God, the flame comes from his hand, and everything just burns. So this is not so good for the priests. Now, for reasons that are not explained, um, 
Elijah slaughters all 450 priests. <laughs> and you know, these are just, these are the reasons why the Old Testament is a little hard to understand. <laughs> like, he defeated him, why did he slaughter them? But maybe at the time, they were simply an evil influence and had to be slaughtered. I mean, you can actually think about that. If he left them on their own, they would just go sowing more heresy. I'm just trying to rationalize it. But in any case, he slaughters all of them, which doesn't please Jezebel or King Ahab very much. So he um, goes, in, goes to the wilderness and hides away in a cave. And while he's in this cave, which is a long period of time, and in the, in the Old Testament, there's just this sort of not quite clear conversations between God and Elijah. I mean, not quite clear. Again, this is where I, I don't, I'm not able to really interpret what's really being said here. But it's, it somehow seems that um, Elijah is feeling kind of discouraged. He's feeling discouraged because God has been trying to make the world better for a long time and it doesn't seem to be working. And Elijah is trying really hard to make the world better and it really doesn't seem to be working. And so you might say he's having the dark night of the soul. Maybe he's, he's on his own mount of temptation. Because bear in mind, even the avatars, they, they, they take on enough of the human condition that they, they live through the human experiences. Master describes an autobiography of a yogi, his own you know, search for God and his deep longing for God. Um, um, that part of Jesus' life was taken out of the Bible. Master says Jesus went to India and studied with the, with the masters in the Himalayas, with Babaji Lahiri and Sri Teshwar. And, that's, uh, and he did sadhana there. So Judaism, I mean Christianity, Jesus does know sadhana. He's just perfect the whole way. But in the Indian tradition, even the avatars have, have a, an opportunity to demonstrate how we realize God. So perhaps that's what this portion of the Old Testament feels like. After he's defeated these 450 priests and dispatched dispatch them from their bodies, he's hiding out in this cave because Jezebel, again, is trying to kill him everywhere. And it, after this wrestling with God and not coming to a resolution, God orders him to go and stand at the mouth of his cave, just stand outside his cave. And then this enormous experience happens, and this tremendous hurricane wind just blows all through and around, and um, Elijah watches this extraordinary power of the wind but he perceives that it's just the power of the wind. And again, the, the symbolism, it's not perfectly clear, but it's just the power of the wind. It's not the voice of God. And then earthquake comes, and earthquakes sort of shatter the land around him, and Elijah stands there and he says, you know, this is great power, but this is not yet the voice of God. And then fire comes and burns all around him, and he watches the fire. You know, these are, these are great forces but this is not yet the force of God. And then after all of that happens, then in the silence that follows, and of course this symbolism is obvious, and this is, this is how the Bible says it, and I believe this is where this phrase came from, Elijah hears the still, small voice of God speaking within him. And so this great episode which I think, I think, and this is me just guessing, would be like his sadhana, his 40 days in the wilderness, his mount of temptation, that Elijah goes through this, and in the end, God shows him all the power of nature, which is what the god of Baal rules, shows him all the power of nature, and Elijah knows that this is not the power of God, this is the power of the material world, because the power of God is the opposite. It's the still, small voice within. So after this experience, Elijah is um, sent down from the mountain, and he's sent to go find Elisha. And Elisha is his dedicated disciple. So the story is told, he finds Elisha plowing a field, and he has 12 pairs of oxen, Elisha does, 
immediately Elisha recognizes Elijah. He, he drops everything, and he, he leaves everything to follow Elijah. Elijah recognizes Elisha. Elisha recognizes Elijah. I always think, if I think of Sri Teshwar and Master, about that beautiful phrase in Autobiography of a Yogi, when Master meets Sri Teshwar in Varanasi, and he kneels at his feet, and he says, this was not the first time I knelt at these holy feet. And it's just a simple statement, but so much is implied in that. So when Elisha sees Elijah, and there's a, another just odd thing in the Old Testament that um, he killed all the oxen. And it, elsewhere it says that sometimes at that time when someone wanted to, to give something completely to God, you would give it to God by destroying it which is to say that you would completely sever any possibility of it being yours ever again because it would cease to exist, because you, you couldn't just hand it to God. So for whatever reasons, and there's maybe other symbolism I don't know. So from that time on, Elisha was always with Elijah, and then the time came. And we'll just, there are other, you know, stories he Elijah struggled with kings several different times more. <laughs> and, you know, he, he burned up the king's envoys and killed with fire 50 soldiers. And, you know, twice he did that. Basically, Elijah just kept trying to bring righteousness into the world without much success. So now it's time for, for Elijah to die. And everyone knows it's time for Elijah to die. And he has this, this school of prophets, these 50 would-be prophets. And... Elijah knows it's time, it's time for him to die. Elisha knows he's about to die. Elijah keeps trying to send Elisha away. Elisha vows that he will never leave his, his guru's side. He will never leave his side. So they go from place to place, and then they go to the Jordan River near Jericho. It just interestingly, near Jericho is where the Mount of Temptation is that Jesus goes to later. Um, uh, I had never put those two together until I just read this because the Mount of Temptation is right by the city of Jericho. Jericho is very ancient and has been there since ancient times. So um, they, they go to the Jordan and the way they describe it is that Elijah takes off his mantle and he strikes the river with his mantle, which would mean his cloak, and the river parts and Elisha and Elijah walk across to the other side of the river on dry land, and then the river closes. And from a nearby hillside, these 50 um, members of the school of prophets are all just watching this. And Elijah turns to Elisha and he says, what do you want from me? And the, the, the Bible is very terse, but this is how the story is told, that Elisha asks of Elijah, I want, I want your spiritual mantle to fall on me. I want a double portion of your spiritual power to fall upon me. Now, when Master talks about John the Baptist and Jesus later, because one of the strange twists of that story is that John the Baptist seems to be lesser than Jesus at that time. And Master said because he poured his spiritual power into Jesus. But Swami nuanced that a little bit more, saying that Elijah took a lesser role that he didn't really sacrifice his spirituality, but it's partly told that e Elijah did give to Jesus the, this power because it was a guru-disciple relationship. Now, Master was liberated, we don't know when, but e Elisha was already an avatar and goes on to do many miracles and so on, which I won't bother to tell you, but Elijah says to his disciple, he said, if when I die, you see me ascend to heaven, then that double portion of my spiritual power will be given to you. And so the story that is told is that they were standing there on the bank and that a chariot, a chariot descended from heaven with horses of fire and that Elijah entered that chariot and was taken up to heaven. And not only, and, and Jesus watched watched it all happen. And the prophets, the, the would-be prophets, his other disciples also watched it happen. Now, because of that, um, later other people say that Elijah didn't die, that he was just taken to heaven. And so once we don't have reincarnation or we're not quite sure what we're saying, 
one of the ways that Elijah can continue into the future is that he didn't really die. Well, of course he didn't die, because no one dies. Only your physical body dies. But when you're going into Kali Yuga and the understanding gets a little confused, we figure it out as best we can figure it out. So when Elijah disappeared in this fiery chariot, Elisha picked up his mantle. He picked up the mantle of Elijah, which had been left behind, which is a clear sign, of course, the mantle is the spiritual mantle, it's not the physical cloak, that Elijah gave to Elisha his spiritual power. When Master died, he gave his spiritual mantle to Rajasi. This is, this is a, a, a tradition that the spiritual mantle was passed on to a disciple. So Elijah passed it on to Elisha. Elisha was, Elisha was greatly empowered from this. He took, they say that he took the mantle and he he struck the river just as his guru had done. The river again parted. Elijah walked back, Elisha walked back across the river. And all those disciples of Elijah who um, had seen this happen then accepted Elisha as Elijah's successor. And then the, the Old Testament goes on to talk more about the incarnation of Elisha, but it's not relevant. It's interesting, but it's not relevant to the story of Jesus. All of this that I just told you, though, was in the minds of all the people that Jesus was associated with. This, this whole story, every part of it, was completely alive to them. And they were always trying to compare what Jesus was doing to what they knew about um, Elijah, less about Elisha. That was Master telling us that that's where that came from. But at the end of Jesus' life, and we, when we come to this, when he went to the Mount of Transfiguration, and he took Peter and um, James with him, and he went there, and they saw him. He was transfigured into light, and on one side stood Moses, and on the other side of Jesus stood Elijah. And so these two disciples saw that Jesus was in company with the two prophets, of Judaism, and then he was the latest in the line. So it was a complete confirmation of, of the scriptural prophecy that was necessary to declare Jesus the Messiah. So it was tremendously important. And when Jesus was crucified, he just at the end of his crucifixion, he cries out, oh, you know, God, God, why have you forsaken me? But the actual what he called was for Elias. And Elias was the other name for Elijah, just depending on which transliteration or which language you were speaking. Elijah was Elias. And it says in the, in the Gospels of the New Testament, when Jesus calls out for Elias, the disciples say, you know, this man is calling for Elias, meaning he's calling for Elijah. And again, it was like one more. Why would he be calling for Elijah? Because... Elijah came first, and he was, he was the heir to Elijah's power, and that's why he was there. So all of those. So in, in Malachi, the last words of the book of Malachi say, Know that I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before my day comes, thus saith the Lord. So all of this is the beginning of. Now, where I want to take us for, for fun here is to this place at the top of Mount Carmel where there's a grotto, there's a cave. And the cave is said to be the cave of Elijah. And for those of us who have meditated in that cave, if Swami went there, I don't know that he did because it's up, it's, it's on, it, 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 Israel's not a very large country, but it's in a corner where you have to drive for a few hours to get to it. So you have to make a special point of going up there. Um, but those of us who did go there found an extraordinary power in this cave. You know, you're, 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 you're in such ancient worlds, um, but Master said, wherever a true Master has been, his vibrations remain forever. So as you'll see from the pictures I'm going to show you in just a moment, um, the there's a church built around the grotto. And in fact, the way the grotto is, 
It's, it's, the grout is the size of a medium-sized room, um, but it's not very tall because it's just literally a cave. Um, they built the actual altar of the church. It's like the, above the ceiling of the cave is the altar of the church. So there's, there's two levels above it. And you'll see the photographs. And then you can walk down. And also in this cave, um, there is a statue of Elijah. It's just an artistic rendition, rendition but it's really a, a beautiful piece. So what we'll do now is, if you would help me, Keisha, to set these up, we'll show you um, seven slides of the, the cave of Elijah at the top of Mount Carmel. And then we'll hold the last side, which is a close-up of the statue of Elijah, and listen to that beautiful song, In the Spirit. It was not specifically dedicated to Elijah. It was written by St. John. Now, this is just to orient you just a tiny bit. Mount Carmel is on the coast of the city of Haifa. And it, this is just, if you were going there, you would see this. Now, of course, Elijah saw none of that, but we're seeing that right now, except he saw the water. So let's take the next picture. And now there is a, a monastery there. Is it? I'm not sure what denomination it is. I think it's, it might be a convent. Carmelite, of course, that's what I want to say. I knew it wasn't Franciscan. And this is just the outside of the church. Just to give you a feeling, if you were walking in um, the doorway there that you see, um, this is when you come into it. So let's take the next slide. And this is the interior of the church. And if you look, you see, um, you see where those little pillars are and you see the light behind it? That's the grotto. So you walk down a few stairs to get to the grotto and then the altar is a little bit raised. It's, this church is, is beautiful without being too ornate. And this is just a lovely picture of the inside. It has a, a really beautifully painted ceiling. So let's take a look at the ceiling, which is the next picture. You see that you can still see some of the altar above the grotto. You know, some of the uh, art and architecture in Israel, of course, people have poured, poured the very, very best they have into these places. So you can see it was absolutely exquisite. So it wasn't just the spiritual vibrations, it was also the um, artistic, devotional vibrations. Let's go to the next slide. Now you can see the grotto. You can see how big it is. And there's the altar area there. And it's, it's all rough. The ground, the floor is rough, the ceiling and the walls are rough. Just the pillars have been added in order to keep it um, lifted. And on the altar there at the back, here let's see the next picture, we'll see the altar. You see there against the wall, and there's the statue. I presume the, the priests say Mass there. You can walk very close up to all of this. None of this is walled off. You can sit next to it. You can lean against it. You can leave your prayers there. Um, and then let's just go closer to the statue of Elijah. So this is the artist's rendition of Elijah, and he's a bit like Mother Kali there, isn't he? He's both blessing and smiting at the same time. So with this picture, why don't we listen to Swami's beautiful song, In the Spirit.
I was caught up in ecstasy. It was a day sanctified by God. There he showed me the truths of heaven, truths which all seeking him should know. How the soul made to live in freedom can reclaim its eternal right. How the night born of our delusion can be fired blazing with his light Just, we're going to end this, just looking at this beautiful painting by Hoffman of Jesus. And Swamiji has this beautiful song, of course, Mother, all your children call you. We've been listening to this great saga of the centuries of, of sin and redemption and tradition building up and Kali Yuga rising and falling and people sinning and then coming forth, feeling God's presence. So I think Swamiji captured it all in this song. So we'll just listen to it, and then that will be the end of our evening. And when we come back, we'll go to Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. We'll start talking about the temple there, the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, everything that Jesus was born into. So now let's end with this beautiful piece of music. Children, mother, call you, knowing not it's you they call. Some through mists of their unknowing, bruised and hurting when they fall, turn away. But who can leave you? You're the mother of us all. If the child forgets its mother, will she coldly turn away? Wise or foolish, we're your children. Us, mother, if we stray, those whose hearts are torn with anguish lack the power your name to call. Heal their wounds, ma, serve their sorrows. You're the mother of us all. Heal their wounds, ma, soothe their sorrows, you.